So my name's Carl, and I was curious as to how I was going to introduce this, because I'm going through a bit of a transition point. Since the practice started, and about a year before the practice doors were open, I worked with Rob and Octavio, the founders of the practice, coaching and consulting them, and then at some point they asked me to come in as a, one of the owners at the practice. And just in the last few weeks, I've made the decision to leave the practice my last day is on the 1st of June, and this is one of the last presentations I'm going to be doing at the practice as a part of this beautiful establishment that I've been involved with for four years. So it's an interesting transition point for me as well. And there was a lot of this stuff going on for me as I was trying to decide. I turned 50 this year, so I wanted to make sure it wasn't a midlife crisis, and it was a, like a midlife thrive fest is what I'm calling it. So be really clear about you know, the decision-making process. So it's a, it's a pretty big topic actually, talking about decisions. We make thousands of them. Like the decision as to what I was gonna put in this decision-making workshop was a big decision. And as I was going through the workshop, trying to decide, do I leave this point in or do I change it with something else? Decision after decision after decision. So we're gonna get into that. And what I want by the time you walk out that door is to just have a couple of things that you've picked up from this evening. You know, a couple of pearls of wisdom, a couple of ways of looking at things, a couple of different insights. And I'm super strategic and I'm all about practical things. So I want to give you some practical skills, some practical tools, some practical strategies to take away tonight. So that's what I'm about. So this thing is someone the other day or talking to someone the other day and they were talking about motivational speaker. And I've been professionally speaking for, I don't know, 10 years now. I don't consider myself a motivational speaker. I don't want to just motivate people. I want to teach people. And then I want to challenge them to take those teachings and integrate them into their life and do something with them. I feel my purpose here is to learn as much as I can Use myself as a crash test dummy, trialing this stuff out, and then passing on the best stuff that I know. So I'm here to serve you with just these little nuggets. And I know that I've got a couple of things in this presentation that you'll take away, and if you apply them, will make a significant difference to the quality of the decisions you make. I've got no clue how long this presentation is going to take. I've put it together, and I generally... I can talk a lot, so I just need to watch my time piece. I'm gonna finish up the presentation tonight. This is a special time for me as well. As well as this transition point for me, 20 years ago, Easter 1999, I did my first personal development program. Changed the course of my life. So this is the 20th anniversary this coming weekend, and I'm doing a life masterclass, which is the culmination of everything that I've learned into three-day immersion. So I'm super excited about that. So at the end of this presentation, I'm gonna talk about the Life Masterclass. Then we're gonna have a raffle. I'm gonna raffle a ticket for the Life Masterclass and a couple other prizes. And then I'm gonna offer you an awesome deal for the weekend. I'd love to pass on what I've learned here. And if it resonates for you, I'd love for you to join me. So a little bit about myself. Um, it was actually fun going through some photos and I joined the army back in 1987 um, so we didn't have cameras on phones and that sort of stuff so it was hard work trying to find some actual photographs from 20 years ago so this is me with a group of buddies this is me trying to look cool doing that looking over into the distance say eh? and I think I do look pretty cool because my mate is sweating like a crazy man over here so I'm Definitely cooler than him. I never realized how short I am until I see photos of myself <laughs> beside everyone else. And that's why I like this photo, because I'm sort of up on a hill. I was <laughs> gradu graduating from the Royal Military College Duntrain. So one of the things with the military is like, you know, for hundreds of years, I've been modifying, refining this decision-making process, because it's one of the professions in the world where if you make bad decisions, there's you know, significantly drastic consequences. So there's a lot of time put into it. So we would learn about decision-making processes that would you know, take three hours for me to explain. 
So I come from that background. Then I spent five years consulting to Olympic Games, particularly bomb management and security and like, you know, making sure that our plan was so airtight, there were no gaps in it. So I have that sort of background. So say 20 years of strategic planning. Then I left that and started studying a little bit deeper. Um, neurolinguistics programming, you know, reading books on neuroscience and psychology. And I wanted to understand a little bit more of the architecture um, beyond the mental, like how can we tap into a little bit more of ourselves. And my yoga journey started about 20 years ago as well. So 20 years ago, I did a personal development program with Tony Robbins. And best decision of my life, and that decision came because I was in a lot of pain. I decided to do his program because I was pretty lost. Um, I was drinking heavily, trying to numb myself to the image that was reflected to me in the mirror. I felt like I was being a bit um, cowardly about how I was living my life. I was playing the safe game and a part of me just didn't feel right about that. So with enough pain and, you know, as happens in this, you know, beautiful, magical, mystical universe of ours, the right things happen at the right time for all the right reasons and we may not know them at the time. But about 2 o'clock a.m. on a particular morning, I've switched the television on and there's this guy, Anthony Robbins, an American success coach, talking about this 30-day program. So I signed up for this program back 20 years ago, 30 days, and that changed the course of my life. I started yoga then, I went vegetarian, and I stopped getting drunk. And it was a huge shift for me especially the stop getting drunk, because when it comes to the decision-making um, process, drunk doesn't equal good decisions. Who's ever made poor decisions due to alcohol? And if you don't have your hand up, you're just a non-drinker. <laughs> yeah. I used to blame all these things for why things wouldn't go well for me. I'd call it unlucky or whatever. And then I took the alcohol factor out and I'm like, whoa make about a tenth of the stupid decisions I used to make. So, huge difference. You know, this Paramahansa Yogananda who's up there is, you know, one of the pillars of the practice, of the, the teachings at the practice. So I was introduced to his work as I started my yoga journey and I love the philosophy of yoga and I've always been about yoga off the mat. So, you know, it's, it's great, the practices we do on the mat, but how do we take that into life? And I'm going to talk about, you know, some of the specifics within this practice of yoga that aid the decision-making process. And then this guy, who's had anything to do with Dr. Joe Dispenza? Who's been to one of these five-day or seven-day retreats? Just knock yourselves out and get along to one. Like the magical, the mystical happens there in spades. The last one I went to in Berlin, there was a guy that had a stroke um, years and years ago. And so from a medical perspective, you know, if a stroke is beyond about six weeks, it's considered that the brain's atrophied to the state where that will never get its movement back again. So this guy on day one is sort of dragging himself around like this. By day seven, he had his arm up perpendicular to his body. Unheard of, unnatural, doesn't make sense from any scientific perspective. Deep dive meditative work, tapping into the natural intelligence of the body. Powerful, powerful stuff. So if you take nothing away from this but the idea to check out Dr. Joe Dispenza's work, um, you'll be doing yourselves a huge favour, a gift to yourself. His book, um, latest book, Becoming Supernatural. And he'll do workshops where he'll have someone hooked up to an EEG as they're doing these meditations, so measuring their brain activity in real time, and he's getting results at a 200 standard deviations from normal. When you're measuring a bell curve, and if you're three or four standard deviations from normal, you're starting to get into the uncommon. This is off the charts. So he's one of my favorite teachers. He's bringing metaphysics and science together in a powerful, powerful way. So do check his work out, and he drives a lot of what I teach as well. So let's dive into this thing. <clears throat> I 
Does that make sense? Does that make sense? Yes? The choices we make, and I used to just say our choices equal our destiny, but this is a big piece of it. We can make the best choices, but if we don't act on those choices, they're just a lot of hot air. I love in the movie Social Network and um, Mark Zuckerberg's there and the Winklevoss twins and they want to like claim this money because they said it was our idea. And he said if you invented the Facebook, you'd be sitting in this seat here. So the idea is great, but it's what we do with that idea. But this is a big piece of it, the choices we make. So here we are now, this destiny. The idea is, you know, these are all decision points along the way. I'm really proud of everyone that's in this room because you made a decision on a Tuesday night to come here at 7.45 p.m. Some of you, maybe most of you, not knowing what to expect, not knowing what to expect from me, and you made a choice to come along. And what I want to do is I want to honour that choice that you made. And it's those little choices in life that can make such a huge difference. Who's made a little decision in life which has been astronomical to where you've ended up? And it seems not much at the time, but you can look back years down the tracking and see, whoa, I can't believe how much of a difference that made. Might have been something you said no to. Might have been something you said yes to. Change the course of your life. And if we think about it like this, if this is a course I'm taking, I'll make a course um, ad adjustment by just 10%. And in 12 months' time, I'm in a completely different place in space. The decisions you make day by day, they matter. So if you can improve your decision-making skills by just... 10%, 20%, you're like going to make a significant change in your life. So I want you all ears. And one of the things I'm not going to dive deep into today, we go much deeper over the weekend, and it's this idea that we're only conscious, you know, fully present in the moment, not stuck in past or future, but fully present about 3 to 8% of the time. So this is, neuroscientists are saying, round about that range. So for me, I'm very much about how can I optimise what I'm doing in my conscious time? How can I optimise the decision-making in my conscious moments? And I also want to work on, you know, what's happening in the back of my mind. What's my subconscious doing? Is my conscious choice aligned with my subconscious programming? So I'm very interested in neurolinguistics programming is about, you know, rewiring, repatterning the brain. Because there'll be times where I'll be here and I'm like, that's where I want to go. And I'll start moving there and I'll end up here and I'm like, what the fuck just happened? How did I get here? How did I get here? That was where I wanted to go. That was where I consciously chose I was going to go, but I ended up here. What happened? I just got distracted by life. You know, as soon as I slip out of present time consciousness, so as soon as I'm not in the present moment, as soon as I'm past or future, the autopilot, which is my subconscious mind, you know, mid and lower parts of my brain is taking the autopilot and it takes me over here. So I want to know what's out of alignment between conscious and subconscious. This is a lot of my work, is trying to understand what's happening behind the scenes. <clears throat> okay, so here we go. And for me, again, it was trying to choose what, what are the nuggets that are most important for you guys to get the most out of in the shortest possible space of time. It's one of the key things to making a decision. When you're dehydrated, how effective do you think it makes the activity of your brain? When you're dehydrated, do you feel like you make your best decisions? Do you feel sluggish? Do you feel a little bit foggy? Do you feel like there's a bit of a cloud there? So one of the key things, and I'm not talking about the little decisions. Little decisions can make a difference. I'm talking about if you're making a big decision, you need to take care of this temple that's going to like hold the space for this decision. 
and I'd sort of link the physiological with the mental element. So if I want my brain to be as effective as possible, I want to make sure that I'm fully hydrated. I want to make sure I've got the fuel in my body circulating through my body. I want to make sure I'm well rested. So the brain works like a muscle. So if I want to make my best decisions, my girlfriend and I have a relationship where we understand some of this stuff. So if she wants to have a conversation with me that requires me to make a decision, she comes along and says, hey, I need to talk to you about something. I'm like, whoa, hang on. I'm in the middle of something. I'm feeling a little bit frazzled. I've been burning up energy in my frontal lobe because I'm working on this presentation. If this is important, give me 15 minutes. I'll close that up. I'll go and have a couple of drinks of water. I'll walk over to the rice fields. I'll break my vision. I'll look out over the distance. I'll see different colors. I'll let my eyes relax a little bit more. I might have a little bit of a snack. So I've rested myself, micro rest. Then I come back to have that conversation. Because I know if I don't do that, the decision I'm going to make is about 60% potency. But if I level up, if I'm aware that it's so important about the choices I make, how can I physically be ready to make the best choice? Like this is, this is strategy. This is using all the tools you've got to the best of your advantage. You know, don't waste these resources that you've got. You know, one of the things about the frontal lobe to it, it churns energy more than any other part of the brain. So this, you know, burns through energy. So if you've been thinking, if you've been in meetings all day, you're going to be frazzled. That's not the time to be making decisions. And what happens too is it's harder to use willpower when that part of our brain is frazzled as well. So we can't hold back on poor decisions. So the fresher we are, the more willpower we've got to step back and go, okay, this is probably not the best for me now. I can project myself into the future and I can see the negative consequences of this choice and I have that power to pull back now. Like how we, how we use our brain is so important. The second piece, and this is, this is so key. This is so key. Did I say this is so key? This is so key. When you're in a negative emotional state, are you likely to make your best decisions? If you're in a calm emotional state, you think there's going to be a difference between the, the decisions you make? Let me explain it with this diagram or these things. What happens at a brain level, and if we use the tri-brain sort of model of the brain, so we've got the upper, middle, and lower brain, Middle brain, sometimes called the mammalian brain, lower brain, reptilian brain. If we bring to that also the model of sympathetic nervous system, fight or flight, parasympathetic ne nervous system, rest, digest. <clears throat> if we're in a stress state, and I like Joe Dispenza's terminology, lower three chakras, survival, emotional states. So if I'm in survival, emotional states, it also means I'm activating and I'm probably in the mid part of my brain. I'm in the emotional part of my brain, the memory part of my brain. It's called the million part of the brain. So for me, if I'm coming from that emotional place, that lower emotional state, those survival emotional states, I've got the brain of a dog. Mammalian brain. I'm trying to solve problems and I'm trying to solve big stuff using the brain of a dog. How effective is that going to be? Not very effective. So what I want to do, and the other thing is, when we go into a stress state, amygdala activates stress response, what happens is our vision tunnels, and we get to this because we become hyperfixated. This is you know, a safety mechanism built into us. We hyperfixate on the problem so that we can get out of dodge. But if I'm trying to solve problems by looking through this, if I'm trying to you know, work out the best way to walk through this group of people without trotting on people's feet while I'm looking through this, I'm likely to make a pretty shitty job of it. 
when I'm in a relaxed state, when I activate the parasympathetic nervous system, instead of this, I have this. I'm making a decision based on the whole picture. So if you're in a reactive emotional state, you've got the brain of a dog looking through a tunnel, think toilet roll, you know, trying to solve your problems. You're just, you're just hampering your abilities. So as soon as we like activate and get into this parasympathetic state, things broaden up. We see the whole perspective. <clears throat> So here's my story, you know, one of the parts of leaving the practice, and if anyone's been in business before, there's multiple business partners, there's multiple moving parts, everyone comes from different backgrounds, everyone's got different skills, everyone's got different beliefs, there's bound to be some conflict along the way, challenges along the way. So, you know, a couple of things happen along the way, and I'm also thinking about what's the evolution of Carl Massey? Coming up to 50, I've been working at the practice for four years, is it time for me to move on? And if I made my decision while I was pissed off about, you know, some minutiae that happened, you know, in a business conversation, I wouldn't be making my best decisions. So, you know, after conversations or whatever, so okay, I need to step back. So I take myself up to Chandi Dasa on the east coast of Bali. And in that place there, and I'm like in this bungalow that looks out over the water. So for starters, my brain is very relaxed because it can see out over the distance. So it doesn't have to stay hypervigilant for something sneaking up on me. I can go into this deep state of relaxation. Then I can ask myself those truth questions. Then I can actually hear what my innate intelligence, what my wisdom, what my heart's desire is you know, telling me. I can't connect to that when I'm like in a hyperactive state. I can't do that when my nervous system is going like this. I can't do this when I don't have access to the oxygen to my brain. When we go into a stress response, we have something like 70% less blood flow to the frontal lobes of our brain, you know, this decision-making center. So I need to put myself into this emotional state, elevated emotional state. I pop it past the fourth chakra, heart chakra. I'm changing the vibrational energy and I'm starting to connect to something bigger than me. I start, you know, tapping into mother nature around me. I start coming into this very calm state. And in that calm state, I see the bigger picture and I start connecting to this trust in life. Life is for me and not against me. And when I come from that perspective, when I see that whole picture, when I feel that resonate through me, when I can really hear what my heart is telling me, then I know I'm making powerful decisions. Now I might make that powerful decision and in that moment hear the angels sing as um, feedback for me that I've made a great decision. Then I may step away and then there might be the how do I do this. That might change what I'm feeling. Then I might feel a little bit more stressed out. But that's a different sensation. Don't confuse that thing with making a bad decision. But you can't tell. If I'm here and I make a good decision, it just sings. Connect to that and own that you've made that right decision because you've heard it sing. Then it might be rolling the sleeves up and doing the work. That's, the, that's not the right feedback for the decision you made. That's the feedback that just says it's, if you want to do something big and powerful and different and transformational, there's going to be some discomfort. That discomfort isn't feedback on the decision. So I've worked with clients before and they were using the feedback of this feels uncomfortable for it must be a bad decision. Stepping back for it. Oh, you know, this is making me feel uncomfortable or nervous or sick in my stomach or whatever. You know, that's not the right feedback for that being the right or wrong path. The feedback is when I get back into this place and in this state of being, Now I can tell whether that decision is right for me. I can tell whether it's aligned with my path, whether it's on my dharmic path. But I can't hear that when I'm in that stress state, when I'm in the wrong emotional state. So if you take nothing else out of tonight, take out the idea that for the biggest decisions, the most important decisions on, in your life, make sure you're in the best physical state and make sure you're in the optimal emotional state. 
It might be doing a meditation. At the end of that meditation, then you make that decision. You know, just another thing to highlight this idea of trying to figure out how to navigate through this landscape by looking through this tunnel vision. Put yourself in that elevated state, see the whole picture, and make a decision from that place. So having said that, we're just going to do a little um, guided meditation to get into one of those elevated states of emotion. So sit comfortably. <clears throat> Up on your props. Going to be about a five or so minute meditation. Whenever you're ready, you can close your eyes. Start bringing your attention into your body. Start bringing your attention into your breath. And as you breathe the breath in, connect to the sacredness of that breath. That breath is given to you freely without judgment. You didn't have to do anything for it. Every breath you take is sacred. Life giving you life. So as you breathe in that sacredness, feel that sacredness going into your body. Every sacred breath coming inside your body. Feeling it in your heart center. Feeling it in your stomach. And as you connect to your stomach and you allow it to relax even more, Feeling the diaphragm extend the stomach on the in-breath and contract it back towards the spine on the out-breath. And feeling yourself relaxing even more and even more. And now imagine that there's this seed that drops down through the crown of your head, goes right down to your spine and lands around your navel center. And as you connect to this seed landing in this fertile soil that you've just created, I want you to connect to the mantra, I am pure courage. And as you breathe in and as you connect to that statement, truly connect to that statement, I am pure courage. Feel it infuse you. Feel it start in your stomach in this navel center, but feel it expand through your whole body. All of you is pure courage. You have it within you. A well of power of energy. Stirring within you. Waiting to be set free. I am pure courage. Now imagine a second seed drop down through your crown, works its way down and settles around the heart center. And as you connect to this seed and the life you breathe into it and onto it is enhanced by you saying, I am pure love. I am pure love. And as you breathe and connect to the statement, I am pure love, it allows that seed to grow, to germinate, to expand, to reach higher and higher heights. I am pure love. And now take your attention back up to your crown where another seed is dropping down and it sticks and stays in the midbrain. And as you connect to that and you connect to the statement on pure consciousness, feel your consciousness expand. Feel your access to that consciousness expand. I am pure consciousness.
Now imagine the seed and energy of that seed at that midbrain connecting to the heart center. The seed and energy of courage connecting to the heart center. And now connecting to the statement, all I need is within me now. And know it at your heart, within the wisdom of your heart. All I need is within me now. Connect to that statement. Connect to the truth of that statement. All I need is within me now. Breathe in deeply and bring energy into that space. Feel it expand. Feel it expand through your whole body. Feel every cell in your body, every trillions of those cells in your body vibrating to the frequency of all I need is within me now. Every cell in your body knows it, has always known it. And in your heart center, you've always known it. You just got distracted. Feel that expand through your whole body. And knowing that when you're in this state, knowing that all you need is within you now, that you're complete, and that you have access to all the tools to make the best decisions in your life. And make your decisions from this place and space. Remember this feeling so you can reconnect to it for the next decision you have to make. And you get to experience the potency of making decisions from this state of being, from this elevated emotional state. We come from a place of love, power and clarity. And taking three more deep sacred breaths into this beautiful body of yours, connecting to your beautiful brain and mind, beautiful heart. And after these three breaths, and when you're ready, you can open your eyes. feels have more mental clarity at this particular point in time and a little bit more self-aware and connected to the conversation and communication that might exist with this inner intelligence that you have with this wisdom of your heart so something like doing a meditation before you start the decision making process you know on the on the weekend I take everyone through my morning routine and one of the morning routine with the one of the main aims of this morning routine, which might take me an hour and a half to do, is to set myself up to make a decision as to what are the most important things I need to work on today. Like if I get that right, and I get that right day in and day out, like successful life. Successful day, successful day, successful day, successful life. So I make the decision about what I'm gonna do each day in the morning after I've meditated when I'm in this state of being then I can see the whole picture make sense it's a big question that one and probably the main question that people are coming to have a conversation with me about to try and figure out what it is they really want and this is the challenge when we're like trying to figure out what we want. There's what other people want from me. There's what I think other people want from me. What I think I deserve. What I've become good at. What I've got in the past. What I sort of want. What I think I'm capable of. And mixed in amongst all of that mess is what I really want. So you can't just, it's not easy to grab a hold of. It requires you to be in a particular state. 
to be able to see amongst all of these things. There might be what other people want. I work with a lot of people and the thing that I said, you know, someone's become good at. So parents might have encouraged us to take a particular path and we've sort of gone into university maybe and studied a particular thing, learned a particular trade and we've gone along and it's about 15 years down the track and then we're like, this isn't really exactly what I want to be doing. But I've become really good at it. So the idea of leaving this to start something else, which I might be doing an apprenticeship to grow in, there's a little bit of a dance here. And someone might, oh, do I leave the familiar known, all of this stuff to step over here into the unknown? To do this thing that I sort of feel that I want to do. Most people stay here. 80%, maybe 90% of the population stay here. Comfort zone. Step over here feels uncomfortable. Step back into here. You know, this, this takes courage. We talked about that. You actually have a well of courage within you. And it doesn't have to be a well of courage to take this huge leap and be the courage to take the next step and the next step and the next step. <clears throat> it's a big decision trying to get there what I really want. And you don't get, what, get to where you really know what you really want until you really slow down. And start asking those deeper questions when you're in those deeper states. So talking questions. So one of the things that a question does, you know, a powerful question causes us to take our attention back up to this part of our brain. Back up to our frontal lobe. This is where we answer questions. This is the powerhouse for us to dream things up, to create something from nothing, to create something that's never been created before. To see a possibility that we've never experienced before. You know, this is the frontal lobe and distinguishes us from other animals on the planet. We've got a bigger proportion of frontal lobe to our cortex, which allows us to see something and look into the future and create a map in the future. You know, mo most animals are living in the present, but we've got this capacity to go in the future. So we need to be able to, you know, put ourselves in the state so we can draw on that. So when we ask a question, it just takes our attention back up there. And one of my favorite questions, I think we'll get to it at some point, is what's the reality? So if I come into a space and things have just gone to a complete mess, there's a complete shit fight happening here, it's just a disaster. Um, if I stay in the mid part of my brain and I start wigging out, I'm not so sure that I'm going to come up with the best solution. But if I come into that space and I ask myself, what's the reality? It causes me to take my attention up here. It causes me to open up and see the whole picture. It causes me to get out of storytelling and see what actually exists around me. And then I can make a powerful choice from that place. So here's a powerful question. This is so important, particularly when it comes to the bigger decisions. Who knows fairly clearly what their top three values are? Like absolute clarity of their top values. It's like a, a powerful exercise to do. We're going to do it on Sunday and like really narrow it down. Because one thing I can guarantee to you, if you make a choice which is out of alignment with your values, I can guarantee you're not going to be happy. I can guarantee it. If it's out of alignment with your core values. So if my core value, number one, is health and vitality. And I choose to do a job which pays me extremely well, gives me these other opportunities, but doesn't allow me to get my exercise time in, my meditation time in. I'm guaranteed to be unhappy. So the extra money I make from that is not necessarily serving me in the bigger picture. So I encourage you to work out what your core values are. Values-based decision making. Come up with a decision and then see how does it measure against my values. Is it in alignment with my values? And let that be part of your guide to the decision making process. 
this idea of, you might have heard of tri-brain, so three brains, so science now is saying there's, you know, neural centers, well, there's obviously neurons in the brain, now sort of going, okay, there's neurons in the heart, and now saying there's neurons in the gut. So there's actually three brains, so instead of communication going from brain to gut, there's actually a channel and highway, information from the gut back up to the brain. So we've got these three intelligent centers. So for me, decision making, a simple strategy for decision making is first I ask, what's my heart telling me? And I need to be quiet to hear that, to tap in the wisdom of my heart. Then I might like, my heart tells me this, and then I go up into my brain, go up into my mind, and I tap into my conscious mind and I ask, what's my conscious mind telling me about this particular thing? And I want to use that to explore. Because my heart might have been telling me one thing, but if I play that out in my mind and I look into the future, I might say, yeah, that's, that's nice on paper from a heart perspective, but there might be some other factors to consider this. I want to tap into this intelligence and I work on building my knowledge up all the time, reading books, digesting stuff, so I've got more capacity in my conscious brain to be able to make the best choices. Then I drop down to my gut. You know, and gut is you know, the older part of our body, um, you know, smallest organisms. They're about moving towards life or moving away from things that are going to disrupt life, like basic organism, basic cell. So my gut is about that. It just tells me yes or no. So if I can learn to listen to my gut, to tap into this intelligence in my gut, I'll start to read whether this feels right at a gut level. So there's a technique of bring it into your heart, take it up to your head, bring it down to your gut, and this is pulling this thing apart, This is, and then bring it back into your heart. Because what you want is your heart to be on board with the final decision. If you make decisions head base and the heart isn't on board, you know, you're unlikely to get joy out of it and you're probably unlikely to succeed in it as well. You want this heart involved in this process. You want all of these in alignment. Heart's this bigger electromagnetic field, tapping into the unified quantum field and starting to shift things around for you. This thing needs to be on board. So heart, head, gut, back to heart. Make sense? So think about that with decisions you're making. Don't just, you know, think, what's my head saying? And don't think, what's my heart saying? Just my, what's my heart saying? Bring all of these into the picture. Use all the intelligence that you have at your disposal. Now, this is one about, um, I've sort of asterisk, not asterisk, italics there, because it's a slightly different question. It's more of, if I know what my big goal is, if I know what my North Star is, if there's a decision to be made, I ask myself, is it in alignment? If, is it taking me closer to my North Star? If I know what my purpose is, if I'm clear about what that is, and I have a particular thought on what that is, that's my North Star. When something comes up, I ask, is this taking me closer to where I absolutely want to go in my life? I might have this primary goal, I want to start this business, I want to create this business, I want to do that, and I'm so passionate, everything's in alignment for it. Someone comes and says, oh, do you want to spend two weeks on an island over here? Sounds great, but is it taking me closer to this thing? I know there's sacrifice to be made to do the big stuff in life. If I want to have the greatest impact, if I want to be, you know, the most powerful expression of myself, and evolve as much as I can over my lifetime. I'm aiming for that big goal. I can't afford to be doing these distraction things over here. So this is if we want to live an elevated life. If one of our primary goals is evolution, we're playing the big game. And we're like, that's not taking me closer to this. Sounds fun, and it'll probably be a hoot, but this is where I want to be. This is what makes my soul sing. Going for this stuff. This is short-term fix. This is, you know, short-term pleasure. This is the big stuff. And this is a conversation we're having tonight about making the decisions. Tapping into this. Staying the course. 
And then just make a choice. And you just make the best choice at the time with the resources you've got. You don't know whether it's the best choice ever until you actually start walking on that path. I remember hearing something, it was um, Winston Churchill, and he's there and this woman's nagging him. And she goes, Winston, you keep changing your mind, in a British accent, however that goes. And, um, and, and Winston says, well, when things change, I change the plan. So it's having that awareness and not being rigidly fixated like that something's changed here. Instead of just, you know, narrow-mindedly following the plan I came up with, I need to change. So I make a choice, but then I come back and I revisit that. I make a choice and then each week I come along and I check up, is this still the right choice? Is this still what I want to do? Is this still taking me to where I want to go? And I make that conversation. I have that conversation each week and each week and each week and I keep adjusting along the way. Because things will change. It's not until you start moving that you get this feedback that allows you to make a better choice. But you need to make a choice and get moving. So some people go, oh, I don't know exactly and they might be locked into the idea of trying to come up with the perfect choice. It's just your best guess at the time tapping in the resources that you've got. And at some point you make a choice. And you might make a choice and go down that road and realize this is definitely what I don't want. Great, feedback. Not failure, feedback. Okay, I need to like change this thing and go in a different direction. And then I get feedback there. It's not failure, it's feedback. And then I change again. So I'm tuned into my environment. I'm staying aware of the bigger picture. <clears throat> Make sense? I'm passionate about this stuff, as you might have picked up. Okay, I'm not sure why I put that thing in there. Woohoo! I think it was, yes, so we've made this great decision, what's next? So one of the things, has anyone read Seven Habits of Highly Effective People by Stephen Covey? Awesome, passed away a couple of years ago, but a, a fantastic book. And he says, and you may have heard this before, start with the end in mind. So made a decision, you start with the end in mind. This is where I want to get to in the end. And that can change as you go along and get more feedback and you check in and go, I thought that's what I wanted, but it's not exactly what I want. So I revise it as I go and it slightly changes. So this is the question I ask when I'm trying to decide, and this is me tapping into the feedback, what's the reality? Instead of getting caught up in story of failure, I'm like, what's the reality? And I make decisions based on the reality, not based on the story. Too often we make decisions based on stories, based on something past. Now we might use the past to know more about the present. But if we keep using the same model from the past for everything in our future, we're just going to keep getting what we've got in the past. The sage like man or woman making decisions, they just go slowly. Ask a question. They stop and they think and they look at, this is what I've got in front of me. This is what I've learned from the past. This is the wisdom I tap into. They don't just blurt something out. They digest it, mull over it, process it, and then come out with a decision. So use the past, but don't be stuck into trying to use the same template that worked in the past. There's a saying in coaching that says, what got you to where you are is a thing holding you back from the next level. Maybe the winning strategy that you had that got you to where you are might be the very thing holding you back. In my case, as I looked at myself in alignment with that um, strategy, I realized that my intensity and my force has got me to the successes I've had in life. But if I wanted to go next level, I need to tap into more creativity. Because for me, creativity is power. This four stuff is, you need to keep feeding it. Force is motivation. I need to keep feeding that thing for motivation. I want to tap into inspiration. I want to be pulled along. That's power. And that power comes when we get out of this place 
when we get up into this place, when we come from love, instead of trying to force things through. A lot of times I see people trying to make decisions when they're just basing so many things on assumptions. What is an assumption? What's your definition of an assumption? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So an assumption is pretty much anything that you're not 100% certain of. If you're not 100% certain of it, it's an assumption. If you sort of go, yeah, I think they meant this. If you're not 100% certain, it's an assumption. I think this is what my mum wants for me or my dad wants for me or my siblings want for me or my wife wants for me or my kids want for me. If you're not 100% certain, that's an assumption. How can you make good decisions when you're using, you know, incomplete facts? So part of the decision-making process, and this is, you know, part of living courageously, this is part of evolution, is having the tough conversations to find what the truth is, rather than basing on an assumption. Or I think she meant this when she said that. Are you certain? No. Well, then have the tough conversation with her to say, hey, I'm not 100% sure what you meant by this. I, this is what I'm feeling or thinking or that might be uncomfortable to have that conversation, but you're going to get so much valuable information from that. It's going to enhance the ability to make a good decision. So tough, dis, tough conversations are part of the decision-making process in order to not work with assumptions. You know, this is from military days, like as we did military planning and that sort of stuff. It would be, are there specific limitations? And now we're getting into sort of a bit of the planning side of things. And within the planning cycle, there's decision cycles as well. But are there any specific limitations? So I'm trying to make a choice of which way to go. I need to know, are there specific limitations? There might be a time limitation. There might be a financial limitation. There might be a resource limitation. I get clear of that stuff before I make my final decision. I want to have all these facts laid out, in, laid out in front of me so I can make these good choices. I want to know what my resources are. <clears throat> you know, one of the key, and I want to know, and I'll get to this, so I'll, with all this stuff laid out in front of me, then I'll start working out what my options are. And in the military, when it came to making decisions, it said, this is where you want to get to. You need to have three courses of action. One, there's no choice. Two, it's just A or B. We always need to have consider the thought process of what are three ways to tackle this thing. So this thing comes down to creativity as well. And, you know, what are my resources down to creativity as well? And my creativity is when I'm in these relaxed states. I'm creative when I'm like using this part of my brain. I'm not reactive, I'm responsive. And I can see different things. I can look outside the box where I'm in that creative state of being. When I look through the lens of curiosity versus judgment. Judgment for me is a bit third chakra, attached to identity, making judgment decisions based on who I think I am, what I think I know. Curiosity is a completely different vibrational frequency. It's a different energy. When I look at something with curiosity, I can look at it from all different directions. I can look at it from something that I think I know. And if I have a curious perspective, if I put these curious glasses on, I can see things from different angles. Even if I think I know something, I come into it with a curious mind. And I might see something that I never saw before. The thing that worked five years ago and has worked for the last five years might not be the thing that's going to take me forward. So I want to stay curious. And then I make a choice and I keep circling through, review and revise. Okay, bonus strategy, a quickie. So I introduced this into the business. Um, I'd read it in a business book. Super powerful for whittling down the choices you need to make. So in the business, someone might come up with an idea and, you know, in a business meeting, Rob Octavia and I would like turn on whoever came up with the idea and say, is it essential or desirable? If it's desirable, we're just going to park it for a while. If it's essential, we're going to put time and energy into it. 
So if you went through life, living your life, asking yourself this so that you're always working on the most important things, the most things essential for you to get to that North Star. You know, as you get up and go through your day, is this essential or is this desirable? That catch up with that friend or that long conversation with someone, is it essential or desirable? That trip away somewhere, is it essential or desirable? It's just a really quick one to get to the heart of the matter. Make sense? Going to use it moving forward? You want to be working on the most important stuff if that's where you want to get to. I've only got 24 hours in a day. We're sleeping six to eight hours of that. Limited amount of time. We can't do everything. You know, so part of decision making is being able to prioritise. Making sure you're focusing on the stuff that's most important. Um, one of the things, and I'm conscious of time, so there was a couple other things I was hopeful to get through, but I don't think I'm going to have time. So I said, like, using this part of our brain to make decisions churns and burns the most amount of energy. The part of our brain that uses less energy is the, the lower part of our brain, reptilian part of our brain, cerebellum, um, high density of neurons there. So it requires less energy. So when we learn a habit, that's where it goes into our brain. That's where the neural pathways are established. So it's important for us to establish as many powerful, positive habits as possible so we don't have to be con constantly trying to make a decision because making decisions uses energy. So as quickly as possible, we want to learn the habits. So it might be the habit of a daily routine or a morning routine. Who has a pretty powerful, very clear morning routine happening? Okay, so for those people who don't have your hand up, Take some time to look into it. I sort of liken it to an elite athlete. There's the game, and before the game, the, the elite athlete prepares themselves for the game so they can high perform. The game of life, I want to like prepare myself at the start of the day so I can play that game at peak level. And I do that by having habits. I have a habit of meditating, and I've had a habit of meditating for about seven or eight years now, every day. Probably miss a handful of days, maybe five days through a year, three to five. Maybe I'm on a flight or whatever and it sort of disrupts me a little bit. But I have this habit of doing it. And the habit is when I wake up from bed, I go to the bathroom, I go to my office and I meditate. I don't have to think, I don't have to make a decision, do I or don't I meditate? It's a habit, it's what I do. It's who I am, it's who I've become. So look at those you know, those habits that you can integrate into your life, which cause you not to have to make a decision every time. You know, I'm about conscious living. I'm about consciously choosing. And this has been my work for the last 20 years, is identifying the little things that have the highest return on investment and integrating those into my life and making them a habit so I don't have to decide. So habits are these things that are at subconscious and if we're only 5% of the time conscious of what we're doing, we really need to have a good handle on what's happening in our subconscious, what's happening in the mid and lower part of our brain. Really be working on that. So we want to save our energy for the really important decisions. Not the little stuff. We create these routines, we create these habits that take care of that stuff. So then we only need to fire up our brain for like the really important stuff. So be conscious of the habits you have. Be conscious of working on this. <clears throat> okay. I've done a short presentation on this for the practice online. So... If you're a member of the practice online, jump in there. If you're not a member of the practice online, you can join for 30 days to check out this, where I go through this process. It's these three C's 
this is sort of you know what I've built up over the last several years so I'll go through it extremely quickly and I go through in more detail curiosity and creativity give me some clarity about what I want but it's not until I step forward and I get feedback whether I truly know so I sort of say this is potential clarity and this is real clarity I need to have courage to step forward to get that feedback. Most people stop here because there's this fear barrier. They sort of think they're clear of something, build stories around it, back off from it at that particular stage. This is where this is one of the most important things you can develop in life. For me, it's more important than confidence. Courage is the key. Courage is try something out. Courage to get potential rejection. A courage to maybe get some negative feedback. That stuff, that stuff is essential to get to this place. And when you get really clear, then you start elevating the results you get. Curiosity, creativity, courage lead to clarity.